The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the investigative journalist who wrote The Case for Christ is now on a new assignment. Now, hear Lee Strobel make the case for miracles. Then, a dedicated atheist. I'm not going to fight this anymore. Who started to examine her own beliefs. Why do I have to act a certain way? Comes face to face with a truth she couldn't deny. I was like, what do I believe? On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The Facebook scandal is taking its toll on its founder and its stock price. CEO Mark Zuckerberg has seen his personal net worth plummet by $10 billion as the stock has dropped and people are joining the hashtag delete Facebook bandwagon. Ouch. <laughs> the social network giant has come under fire for not protecting the privacy of its users. And now the United States government plus 37 states want answers. Charlene Aaron has the story. Facebook is being rocked by claims that your privacy and personal data are up for grabs. The Federal Trade Commission is now investigating the social media giant following a week of privacy scandals, including whether the company engaged in unfair acts that caused substantial injury to consumers. 37 state attorneys general are also seeking answers on how Facebook monitored what app developers did with data collected on Facebook users and whether Facebook had safeguards to prevent misuse. The state attorney of Cook County in Illinois has filed suit against Facebook and Cambridge Analytica for consumer fraud. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Cambridge Analytica, a political data mining firm, is accused of lifting data from some 50 million Facebook users to influence voters in the 2016 elections. Our responsibility now is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The scandal has exposed the lax safeguards at Facebook, app developers allegedly taking advantage of a lack of privacy protections to snag personal data from tens of millions of Facebook users and use that info for politics. Billions of users are starting to discover what can actually be done with data that seems somewhat innocuous, like baby pictures and you know likes of articles that they read somewhere on the internet. Monday, Facebook was hit by another controversy after revelations that the social media network has been storing tons of contact information of Android users. The company acknowledges that in 2015, it began uploading call and text logs from phones running Google's Android system through its Messenger app and later through Facebook Lite. The fallout involving Facebook has many, including Apple's Tim Cook, calling for new privacy laws but some say they don't see a plan from Facebook. What I heard was a set of aspirations um, and a desire to earn back the trust of his users. What's problematic about that is that Facebook really hasn't changed its business model since its inception, which is it harvests the data of its users and it sells that data to advertisers, or in this case, to uh, uh, let a, uh, an academic researcher in England use data which he in turn sold to Cambridge Analytica. Meanwhile, after word of the FTC investigation, Facebook's stock has plummeted by more than $70 billion. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, the story has a lot of ramifications. If you've ever used Facebook to sign in to another app, did you realize that you were sharing all of your Facebook information uh, with that app developer? And then if you're an Android phone user, uh, do you really want the metadata on all your texts, all your phone calls? So who you called, how long you talked, uh, all within your Facebook profile. Uh, these are these are privacy issues, and it's, as I understand it, there w wasn't full disclosure on what Facebook was going to to do with the data, or how it was going to use the data. But quite clearly, there's a profile, and they're selling that information to advertisers. Uh, it's going to be a long year for Facebook, in, in my opinion, and we're going to see more of this hashtag delete Facebook. In other news, Russia is facing a global crackdown for its bad behavior. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? 
That's right, Gordon. President Trump is kicking out 60 Russian diplomats from the United States to show solidarity with America's allies around the world after a nerve gas attack in the United Kingdom. The White House says the ousted Russians are all spies, according to the Associated Press. The U.S. also closed the Russian consulate in Seattle, which was deemed a counterintelligence threat. The ability of Russia to spy on Americans and conduct covert activities that threaten America's national security. About 20 Western countries have expelled more than 135 Russian diplomats. That includes nearly two dozen in the United Kingdom. The nations are punishing Moscow for its alleged poisoning of a former Russian spy and his daughter in Great Britain. Well, the FBI is investigating the delivery of suspicious packages sent to the military and intelligence facilities here in Washington, D.C. Half a dozen packages were shipped through the mail. They all contained explosive components. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Each of the packages has been collected for further analysis. Well, a Holocaust survivor has been killed in Paris in an apparent anti-Semitic act of murder. The Times of Israel reports that the 85-year-old Jewish woman was stabbed 11 times and then set on fire. Police have arrested a Muslim neighbor and a homeless man in the case. Last year, a similar anti-Semitic murder took place in France when the killer shouted Allahu Akbar as he threw a woman out of a window. Well, Turkey is partnering with Islamic jihadists to conquer territory in neighboring Syria. It's the latest sign of the radical Islamist agenda being rolled out by Turkey's President Erdogan. Now Christians from the town of Afrin are running for their lives, chased down by bloodthirsty terrorists. Chris Mitchell has their story. As the battle over Afrin grew closer to the city, many Christians found themselves in grave danger. <laughs> This is a church service of the Christians crying out to God for deliverance as Turkish and Islamic forces drove towards Afrin. Charmaine Heading, the founder of the Shai Fund, helping the persecuted church in the Middle East, kept in touch with many of these Christians. A lot of information was coming to them that when these different people who came in who support this radical Islamic ideology that we've seen with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, that they would behead the Christians and they would kill them. And because many of these Christians are, were originally Muslim background believers, they were particularly going to be targeted. CBN News has also learned of an added danger. Jihadists broke into the church, found pictures of some believers and distributed them. They're now hunting them down door to door. They say our situation is very dangerous and we don't know what to do because they found photos in the church building and he said they are searching for the believers now in Afrin. So he's the man, he's crying, uh, he don't know what to do. So we need really pray that God to protect him. Heading says most of the Christian families have found safe haven, but says the church in the West needs to pray for its fellow believers in distress. They should pray for their safety. They should pray that these families will be able to stay together because in these chronically desperate situations where masses of people are fleeing, families can get lost and little ones can get hurt. So we need to pray for these families that they'll be able to stay together. Kamal Sido of the Society for Threatened Peoples told CBN News the West needs to help. USA have, Christian have to help Kurds in North Syria as well in Turkey, Iraq and Iran. It's very, very important to support Kurdish people in this situation, to protect Kurds because we need Kurds as uh, um, alias in the fighting against radical idea in Middle East. Heading says what is taking place in Afrin is ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. We know from what the statements that they've made that they want to get rid of the people in this area and bring in other people from Syria. So it's a population mm -hmm. yeah. displacement. Following the battle over Ifrin, many Middle East observers feel Turkey and these Islamic groups will continue to expand and try to conquer more territory. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. And Gordon, as Chris just said, prayers and help needed for the Christians there in Ifrin. And we also need to be very aware of the rise of Turkey right now. We've been reporting on, on several stories that are very disturbing about uh, a, an increase in in, in their desire to resume the Ottoman Empire, to resume the caliphate, to be the head of all of that. 
uh, and to go back to the borders and how they were before World War I. Uh, and if that's their stated goal, they've talked about raising an Islamic army to attack Israel. Uh, what happened in Turkey after World War I, an ethnic cleansing of monumental proportions where they either killed or kicked out every single Christian in the country. Uh, and then you add to that before World War I, the Armenian massacres, the, uh, the genocide of Armenia. Uh, when this gets unleashed again, uh, I, I don't think we're prepared for it. Uh, but will we respond to it? That's going to be the question. And are we going to respond now with prayers? But uh, from a diplomatic standpoint, uh, Turkey is, uh, is an anchor country in the NATO alliance. If they continue down this path, what will NATO do? Terry? Well, eight years after an earthquake devastated Haiti, one man is on a mission to help the nation rebuild. But first, he has to teach them how to build. We have to build a construction industry and invest in the workers. Hear how this company is also rebuilding lives when we return. The country of Haiti has been wrecked by earthquakes, hurricanes, and rampant poverty. Still, there are some who hold out hope for the island nation. CBN's Eric Rosales shows us one man who's working to bring the gospel to Haiti and empower its people to rebuild. It's been more than eight years since the country of Haiti was hit by a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. And despite billions in humanitarian aid, corruption has forced much of the country to continue to live in deplorable conditions. And while organizations work to treat the consequences of extreme poverty, they haven't provided solutions to reduce Haiti's dependence on foreign aid. One man's hope to change that by building builders. It's one of the most difficult, frustrating, rewarding things I've ever done. And, and I think the, for me, because of my personality, the, the the frustration is I want things to move faster and, and, and stuff, and I, I love building things, but we, we have to in, invest in the people first. Sherman Balch, a commercial contractor, first came here just months after the massive quake as part of a mission by Cornerstone Fellowship Church in Livermore, California. He and his wife, Cheryl, were struck by how poor construction standards contributed to so much of the devastation. Oh, my husband being a builder, we thought, Let's go, you know, help rebuild. But then it became evident that there were many Haitians who were not working, didn't have hope in their daily lives. So why not teach them how to build properly? That desire, combined with help from their local church, helped create extolo, which means raise up in Latin. They started by using Haitian workers to help build several orphanages. We have to build a construction industry and invest in the workers, and we use um, uh, what's the apprenticeship approach of uh, uh, earning, uh, learning by doing and uh, learning, uh, earning and learning at the same time. And I've been looking for jobs and here, but I didn't have any skill. But I've been looking for, uh, for someone to teach me how to do things. As part of the orphanage construction crew, Alto Jean Bautiste learned basic masonry, carpentry, electrical and plumbing skills. The Baltas are quick to add this isn't just about learning a trade, it's also learning about God and living a life like Jesus. A great leader is not the person who is good at everything. Part of the training includes leadership classes for the Haitian apprentices. During our visit, Cornerstone pastor Steve Matson talked about living a life of integrity and respect. We then traveled to one of the orphanages. After a quick flight to Laganov, a small island about 50 miles from Port-au-Prince, and a white knuckle landing on a dirt runway. We saw the Jesus Home for Children Village providing a new life for more than 150 orphans. Extolo has built a beautiful village for the kids. It's more than I could ask for. God has answered our prayers. We're inside the orphanage and you can see behind me this patio. This is where the kids have their Sunday service. And around the courtyard are 10 homes. Inside each home, anywhere from 10 to 15 orphans. The kids also have a home mom. Madam Soliette doesn't want to make this an institution. She wants to be able to have the kids interact with their home mom and also each other, this way that they'll grow in spirit. 
You may not realize it, but more than half of the people here live on less than $2 a day. Some 70% are underemployed or simply have no job. Most can't afford even basic housing, so parents often give up their kids. To help keep families together, Madame Soliet opens her doors daily to feed some 300 neighborhood kids and also allows them to attend school. She always says, I want to raise these kids up to love the Lord and be not adopt them out of our country, but be the change in our country, to be the leaders and the people that this country needs the next generation to change things around. Leaders like John Bautiste, who's currently building his own home, helping neighbors with repairs and providing for his family. But most of my family practice a lot of food. And uh, when I met Extolo, and every morning people start to pray, talking about God and uh, giving people Bible. More importantly, he's accepted the Lord and now leads Bible classes. His dream is to run his own construction company, create buildings with universal standards to withstand any future quakes, and provide a good living for fellow Haitians. We care about them. We love them. Jesus loves us. He's blessed us. So we, in turn, want to be a blessing to the wonderful people of Haiti. And they're so appreciative. It's so fun. Just as Jesus built disciples, Extolo officials are building the next generation of Christian leaders and builders to bring positive change to the country of Haiti. Eric Rosales, CBN News. Well, Haiti is a prime example. If you can go in with relief aid, you go in with food, you go with, you know, let's, let's rebuild, but you're not focused on the people and building the people, uh, then you're going to miss. Here we are eight years later, and uh, this, this ministry has it right. How, how, do we, how do we change things? And if you'd like to learn more about how this ministry is helping the people of Haiti, all you have to do, uh, you can find a link for Extolo International at cbnnews.com. And, uh, you know, let me just make another comment here. Culture matters. Uh, I know it's not politically correct to single out a religion, uh, but when you look at a nation that's given over to voodoo, and you heard it in the story, my relatives uh, practice voodoo, they do this every day, but coming here, I, I learned about Jesus, I learned about the Bible, I was given a Bible, we pray every day, and I'm noticing a difference. Well, take a look at a map, and go look at Haiti, and then look right next door. Same island, same natural resources, but the Dominican Republic is so much different than Haiti, the standard of living is so different, and it's because it's not given over to voodoo. So we've got to realize it in, in what we do, how we deliver international aid, how we help people. The very first thing you have to do is build the individual. The best way to do that is to let them know they're a, they're a child of God. They don't have to worship demons. They don't have to live in this superstitious world. Uh, they can walk free of all of that. Uh, it really does matter, and, and the gospel really matters. You look at the history of Western civilization, uh, it was built on the gospel, and we need to recognize that. Terry? Amen. <laughs> well, coming up, an atheist shares the moment she renounced her belief in God, and it wasn't what she was expecting. I remember the moment that I really thought, maybe this isn't true. It was like somebody had died. It was like a darkness had gone over me. Find out what brought her back to the faith when we come back. Veronica Heinlein fancied herself as an intellectual, and she couldn't wrap her mind around how a supposed awesome God allowed bad things to happen. So throughout her teenage years and into adulthood, Veronica went on a quest of discovery. And here's how she found the truth that she'd always been looking for. I absolutely loved orchestra. We're playing Beethoven, we're playing Vivaldi, we're playing Mozart. Ever since she was young, Veronica Rogers Heinlein relished being known for her musical ability. People admired my music, my talent. She grew up in a loving family in San Francisco. Both her mom and dad were pastors, so faith and church were the center of their lives. 
My dad's very theological, philosophically sound. So any questions that we asked, he was never intimidated by. My mom added this element of um, wonder to our belief. God is infused in who we are and he allows us to be who we wanna be. But at 12 years old, Veronica would question everything she had been taught. A split in their church compelled her parents to take a sabbatical and move to Central California. For Veronica, it was devastating to realize the church wasn't perfect after all. When I was around brokenness, it was hard to be around that because I'm like, I don't want to be broken. I don't want to be seen as broken and weak. I wanted to be somebody who could be admired. I'm just like, God, can people be successful in Christianity? It also affected her view of God. I started to go, wait a minute, why would somebody so awesome allow so much division and pain and emotional turmoil. The only identity she felt sure of was being a musician. At 16, she enrolled in college classes and joined the orchestra. She started meeting people with different viewpoints, most of which were opposed to Christianity. Not wanting to stand out, she kept her beliefs to herself. My uh, self-confidence was determined by how people thought of me. Uh, it was really hard for me to be in circumstances like college where they make you feel like an idiot if you believe those things. Other people's opinions definitely started affecting my own. And when I started to compare and contrast, I was like, what do I believe? Even more influential was a man she met 13 years her senior. He was a musician and an outspoken atheist. I was just curious, I'm like, what is it like to not believe in God or not to have these values or expectations upon yourself that you have to act a certain way? Why do I have to act a certain way? The two started dating despite her parents' strong objections. At 18, she told them she was leaving. And I said, well, Veronica, if you walk away, that's your decision. I said, but we're your parents, we love you. We will not tolerate what's going on between you and this guy. That same week that she walked away, we had a minister's retreat. And the pastor at that retreat, his first, um, his message was about his daughter, prodigal. And uh, so that just triggered to me that she's, she's become a prodigal. That same year, Veronica went to UCLA on a music scholarship. She spent the next three years partying, playing music, and searching for the truth. She had little contact with her parents, who continued to pray. Veronica's name was first on the list when their church started a prayer wall. I was not a pillar of faith, and I depended on my friends that believed that God was gonna bring her back. And, and so sometimes I'd get really weak. I could tell, you know, I'm like, oh, this is never gonna happen. You know, I get so tired. Meanwhile, Veronica decided the only way to quiet the battle in her mind was to dismiss her Christian faith. I remember the moment that I really thought, maybe this isn't true. It was like somebody had died. It was like a darkness had gone over me and I relinquished to it. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna fight this anymore. After graduation, she broke up with her boyfriend and took a job as a preschool teacher in Houston, Texas. Exhausted and irritable most of the time, her only way to relax was yoga and smoking pot. I didn't have music. I didn't have the intellectualism anymore. I had the partying, but then that was really rough on my body, so I didn't have the energy anymore. I didn't really have much else at that point. Also living in Houston was her older sister who worked at a crisis pregnancy center. Unlike Veronica, she had held on to her Christian faith and had joy in her life. I started talking to her more, asking her more questions, asking her about God. And there was just a depth there that started piquing my interest. Like this is more than what I heard as a kid. This is a daily walk. This is something where she's getting refreshed every day. Then, in March 2015, Veronica was in a bad car accident, but walked away with no injuries. Her sister pointed out that God had protected her for a reason. And then she looked me square in the eye and she's like, do you think it was a coincidence that you didn't get hurt in your car accident? 
And I realized at that moment that people were praying for me. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna give it a try. It's very non-spiritual prayer. I was just like, Jesus, you know, if you're there, I give my life to you, I have no other options, you know, do, it, do with it what you want. Her sister gave her a book about Christianity, atheism, and the truth about creation in Genesis. You start seeing that it's the relationship between God and man and the redemption that's there that you cannot find in drugs, you can't find in intellectualism, you can't find in your friendships, you can't find in your relationships, you can't find in your family, you can't find in yourself. And, you know, that was just a big moment for me. With renewed faith, she grew in her relationship with Christ. God showed her that His plan is better than her desire to be part of the crowd. God's really challenged that and said, no, that's not, it's, that's not what it, it's about. It's about you being you and allowing me to be glorified within who you are, because that's who I created you to be. I'm influenced by God, and my identity is in, in Christ and how He has forgiven me. When they learned their prayers for Veronica had been answered, Kenny and Nikki shared the good news with a church leader. I said, so what do we do with the names once the prayers are answered? I said, because Veronica, and she's like, praise the Lord, Veronica's better. So we put Veronica's name up at the very top. She was the first one on the board, and the first name that she had you know, come back to the Lord. Veronica married in 2018 and uses her passion for music as a worship leader and children's minister. She knows that her true identity and joy come through Christ. He created me for a purpose. I'm here because He loves me. I have a walk that I'm on and a journey to be finished faithfully. I'm waiting for that day when He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me be a good and faithful servant. Help me be a good and faithful servant. You know, it's not an easy thing to follow Jesus, but it's really not an easy thing to try to make it out there in the world. You know, the voices are loud. When you don't know who you are, and lots of people don't, whether they're 16 or 60, then often you allow yourself to be defined by the people and the circumstances and the situations around you. One of the things that Veronica found was that there was no joy in that. I so related to her very sort of sarcastic, tentative prayer to God because it's exactly the same one that I prayed. So scarred by the world, so disappointed, so lost, just lost, that one day I too said, God, if there is a God. Jesus, if you're real, I give you what's left of my life and you can do what you want with it. And if you're not there, I'm no worse off than I was if I didn't say this prayer. It was hard to trust, hard to believe. You know, if you let the world in, they'll destroy you. All the world, water in the world, can't sink a ship unless it gets inside, so be careful what you let inside. But once you've done that, understand that the arms of God are always stretched out to you. You can't be too bad, go too far, sin too much, to not be able to be received back into the arms of your loving Father. You see, you were created for that. We are created to be relational with each other, yes, but first and foremost with the one who created us. We've got nothing to give until we have that. It's not bad to be on a search. I think we're all searching for significance in our lives. What's bad is when you rule out allowing the one who created you with that very need inside of you, it's at the core of your being, and you don't give him the same opportunity you give everything else. All the talent, all the drugs, all the sex, all that the world has to offer, the fame, the glory, none of it will satisfy you. Because that's not the puzzle piece that fits what fills your heart. It's only a relationship with your loving Father 
who knows you by name. The Bible says he's carved your name in the palm of his hand. Not a sparrow falls from the tree that he doesn't see it. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's part of the life we're in here. You heard Veronica say, we're on a journey, my friends. And the goal is not to be happy every day with every situation. It's to get over the finish line. So I would say to you today, are you running the race? Are you walking out your journey? Are you filled with the kind of joy that sustains you even in the midst of loss? Because you can be. You can be. Jesus died to save you and me from who we are without him. Today, come home to the Father heart of God. Come home, just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Come into my heart and my life. I, I open the door, I give it to you. Make something that matters out of my life. Teach me more about who you are. Change the way I think without you. I want to run the race with gusto. I want to get over the finish line. Listen, if that's your heart desire and you've prayed that prayer or you want to pray that prayer, call our toll-free number. There's a friend on the other end of the line who's prayed that prayer and found peace and joy beyond description. And they'd love to pray with you today. Our line's toll-free. It's 1-800-700-7000. When you call, ask for a new day. The prayer is the beginning of a journey that lasts a lifetime. We'd love to help you walk that journey out, and this is free for the phone call. So call now. Gordon? Still ahead, the case for and against the existence of di divine miracles in our world. Best-selling author Lee Strobel shares stories of people who beat the odds and shares what the experts think about the supernatural. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Civil rights icon Linda Brown has died. She was once the little girl at the center of the landmark case called Brown versus the Board of Education. She was rejected when her father tried to sign her up to attend an all-white school in Topeka, Kansas. Her case went before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954 and led to the end of racial segregation in schools. Brown died Sunday at the age of 76. Well, faith-based faith films did very well at the box office for a second straight weekend, scoring in the top 10. I Can Only Imagine captured the third spot once again behind Marvel's Black Panther. Apostle Paul, uh, Paul, Apostle of Christ, earned the number eight slot. It stars Jim Caviezel as the gospel writer Luke learning from the Apostle Paul. I Can Only Imagine stars Dennis Quaid as an abusive father who changes after coming to Christ. Quaid spoke with CBN News about the movie's message of healing. The gift that Arthur gave to Bart was that Bart did not have to carry that around for the rest of his life which would be a heavy, heavy, heavy load, you know. He broke that chain and that, and that freed Bart as well. And um, just a beautiful, beautiful story, really, you know, about making the impossible possible. It's rare for two films with Christian themes to make the top 10 at the box office. And you can find more CBN News exclusive content and interviews on these films on our website. And you can also get the latest headlines at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. We live in an age of skepticism. Scientific discoveries have helped us understand the way the world works. But what about the situations where there seems to be no explanation? Could they be the result of miracles? Well, we asked some people on the streets to give us their take on the issue. The statistics will show that most people actually do believe in miracles. Do you believe in miracles? I absolutely believe in miracles. I've had numerous things happen in my life that I knew was God. Sometimes we aren't able to explain them, but sometimes we don't need an explanation for it. Just have faith. 
I guess in a way every day is a miracle that you're here, but I personally haven't seen anything, but I definitely do believe in them. Well, me personally, I've been hit by cars twice on my bicycle. Wow. I walked away from both of them with nothing broken, yeah. If had asked me this like three weeks ago, I'd probably said no, and I kind of believe in logic and science. Miracles are kind of like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. So I think people just need to be aware of what's around them. I think it's a miracle that my beautiful grandson is here. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer. Now today, I'm, I'm a witness that God is real. Well, for more on this, we've got author Lee Strobel, and his latest book is called The Case for Miracles. And welcome back. It's good Thank to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Great to be with you. All right. Well, tell us, what's, what's the case for, give us the argument. What's the case for miracles? Well, you know, like your previous uh, feature you had about um, the woman who was an atheist, I was an atheist for much of my life. It was really the miracle of the resurrection that convinced me that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the historical evidence that established that. But after I came to faith, I still had my skeptical nature. Mm -hmm. You know, my background's in journalism and law, so it's kind of woven into my DNA. So I said, you, you okay. You were taught to be skeptical. We were taught, exactly. <laughs> you have the same background. So um, uh, I thought, I did believe the miracles reported in the Gospels, but I didn't know if God is still in the miracle business today. Is he still divinely intervening in people's lives today? And I, so I was skeptical about that, even though as, as a Christian. And so I spent two years of my life now investigating the evidence for the supernatural. And the result is the book, The Case for Miracles, that looks at the results of that. And I found basically three things. Number one, um, uh, God is still in the miracle business. Uh, number two, miracles are a lot more common than we think. And number three, there's a lot of miracles that are far better documented than skeptics suppose. Well, why is it that there, there's both abundant evidence, but yeah. at the same time, it seems to be concealed? That yeah. when there's studies done, uh, does, does prayer work in a medical environment? I mean, even the Temple, Te Templeton Foundation, you bring this out in the book, yeah. they did a study. Right. Um, and it, it didn't seem to show any difference. Very interesting. It didn't. And, and yet, you know, as I reveal in my book, the Christians, quote unquote, who they had praying in that study were not Christians. They were part of a sect that did not believe in a personal God, that did not believe that God answers prayers, that did not believe in miracles. So really the study says nothing about the prayers of Christians. Uh, there are other studies, for instance, one done in Mozambique where a team of researchers came. They measured the eyesight and hearing of the deaf and the blind. They immediately prayed for them, had people who had experience with healings and so forth, lay hands on them, pray for them in the name of Jesus, and then immediately tested them afterward. Virtually all of them had some degree of improvement, some of them astoundingly so, like Martine, who was measured before prayer. She couldn't hear a jackhammer next to her ear. After prayer in the name of Jesus, she could hear a normal conversation. They then replicated this study in Brazil, and it was published in a secular, scientific, peer-reviewed medical journal. It is a valid scientific study. So I think science points in the direction. In fact, I talked to the researcher who did that, who's a PhD from Harvard, who's a professor at Indiana University, and she said, something is going on. Well, I can tell her what's going on. <laughs> God is going on. Well, why is that? Because it seems like within the academic community, even within the medical community, yeah. uh, the skepticism takes over. Yeah. We, we had a, a, a miracle. It was really profound. A, a young boy had uh, blisters in his eyeball from radiation, mm. irreversible damage. Mm. They were talking losing the eye. And um, a miracle happened. Yeah. And the doctor knew it wasn't medically yeah. possible for this. But then she said, well, one day medical science will explain what happened. Yeah. <laughs> That's sort of science in the gaps. That's sort of saying someday science will figure it out. Well, it's interesting. A study showed that 55% of physicians in the United States, so a majority of physicians say they have seen at least one example in their practice of medicine that they can only explain as a miracle of God. So a majority, in fact, a higher percentage of physicians than the population at large says that. So uh, I think a lot of physicians, but they're a little reluctant to say it. I interviewed a scholar who's a PhD and a professor at a major university. He told me for 45 minutes the story of how God had healed him of a brain tumor. And at the end, he said, but you can't put it in your book. Hmm. I said, why, why not? He said, I'm, I'm up for tenure. 
Oh. My, my colleagues will not, they'll think I'm crazy. They, they won't give me tenure. And same with doctors. A lot of doctors, they don't want to put miracle down in their medical report. They're getting a call from the insurance company saying, what does miracle mean? You know, how do you do that? Yeah. So uh, well, there's some miracle, reluctance. I have to pay your bill. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I admire about the book is that you do go into why people don't get healed. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something that we really have to grapple with. Absolutely. I've read a lot of book on, books on miracles, yeah. and yours is one of the first where, okay, let's deal with the other side of this. Yeah, and, I did two things why. out of the ordinary. One, I start the book with an interview with a major skeptic, and I tell him, build a case against miracles, because I want to measure how good is that case. I don't think it's very good, uh, but I put it in the book. And then this question of what about miracles that don't happen? My wife is in pain every single day. Uh, for the last 20 plus years. She has a medical condition that puts her in chronic pain. Um, and there is no cure. And so uh, apart from a miracle, she is gonna be in pain the rest of her life. I would love to see a miracle happen. It hasn't happened, why is that? So I went to a guy who has a PhD in theology. His name is Dr. Uh, Douglas Groteis at Denver Seminary. Brilliant scholar, but his wife is dying prematurely of a brain condition. She's to the point where she doesn't know what a, what a telephone is. She doesn't know what a hairbrush is. And she, she's losing her, her thinking ability at a young age. And so he's able to talk from the mind and the heart. And it is the most powerful interview I've ever conducted in my life. Every sentence from him drips with wisdom and, 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 and spiritual depth because of the head and the heart wedding together. So, uh, you know, that's my best attempt to answer that question. I think, you know, God is sovereign. Uh, God will do as he will do. His ways are above our ways. Even in Jesus' time, healing was not automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew says that Jesus didn't do many miracles in Nazareth. Uh, in uh, Matthew because, chapter 10, yeah. Yeah, Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are given authority to heal. Then seven chapters later, they can't heal an epileptic boy. Uh, Paul leaves Trophimus sick and, and leaves. And then Paul was not healed, apparently, of the thorn in his flesh. So even in Jesus' day, healing was not necessarily automatic. Um, but there's a difference between meaningless suffering and inscrutable suffering. Meaningless suffering is what an atheist encounters, which is there is no hope, there is no meaning. I suffer because the universe, that's the way, I got the short end of the stick, sorry. You know, that's meaningless suffering. Inscrutable suffering says, I don't understand why God does not intervene. But I have all this evidence that points toward the truth of Christianity, that the resurrection is true, that the creation is true, that God is real, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. I believe in all that. I believe he loves me. I be and I believe his ways are higher than my ways. And he understands things I will never understand. And I also believe that Romans 8.28, which we use as a cliche, that God will cause good to emerge uh, from the circumstances of all those who follow him. Um, we throw that line around, that yeah. verse around, but it's true. I'm it's true. Had people in chronic illness say, please don't ever say that. I know, I know. they've heard it and they've heard it. And yet it's true. How, how key is it to that total surrender mm. where regardless of the outcome, yeah. uh, let's leave the name it and claim it behind. Yes. But, you know, God, if, if, if it, it is your will, yeah. um, and, and I'm not sure what your will is right now, yeah. uh, if it is, it's called I'll, I'll take whatever you have for me. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's called the prayer of relinquishment. And Dr. Grothheis prayed that prayer. And the prayer is what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. where he said, hey, I, I'd just as soon not go through this. But Father, I'm relinquishing my will to yours. I'm allowing this to happen because you want it to happen. And so, and we come to the point sometimes when a miracle doesn't happen, we pray a prayer of relinquishment that says, God, I'm not going to make this illness an idol. I'm not going to say, I love you only if you heal me. No, I love you because you are who you are. You love me first. Uh, you've redeemed me. I'm your child. I trust you, even though I don't understand things. I trust you, I'm gonna reaffirm that trust, and I relinquish, relinquish this to you. It's not that I'm giving up, it's that I'm, I'm saying I trust God, even though I do not understand all of his ways. Uh, that's a, a critical moment. Yeah, and this is part of that prayer. Um, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus sang that at the Last Supper, that's part of the hello. Uh, we could talk a long time, but we're out of time. But if you want to know more about this, read Lee's book. It's called The Case 
for miracles. A journalist investigates evidence for the supernatural, and it's available nationwide. Thanks for being here. Thank yeah. you, Gordon. Yeah. God bless God you. God bless you. Terry, over to you. Well, still ahead, a happy ending for a mother who was almost forced to give up parental rights to her children. See what reunited this family when we come back. Well, Nazira had to make a desperate decision by leaving her three children at an orphanage. She did it so, in her words, they would not starve to death. But after two months, she learned that she would have to surrender rights to her children forever. Five-year-old Adamir sat by the orphanage window, watching and waiting. The child ate nothing for three days after his mother dropped him off at the orphanage with his brothers and sisters. I was so lonely. I wanted my mom to come back for me. But Adamir's mother wasn't coming back. I had to give my children up to the orphanage so they would not starve to death. Before giving up her children, Nazira tried hard to support them. She applied for government assistance, but was turned down. Then she was told that after two months of care in the orphanage, she would be forced to surrender her children forever. I could not sign such a paper. I prayed to God, please let there be another way. Several months passed, and Adamir was still waiting by the orphanage window. That's where Orphan's Promise found him. I met Adamir, and I just could tell that there was something different about him, and he seemed sad. And I learned that he had a family, but he was taken away from the family because they were poor. First, Orphan's Promise went to meet Nazira. We decided that with the right skills, Nazira could earn enough money to support her family and be reunited with them. We offered her sewing lessons and a new sewing machine. We also gave her a new stove and food to feed her family and help with the rent until she could provide for her family herself. I am so grateful for the sewing machine to help me make money for my family. Thank you for bringing us back together again. It's been two years since then, and we recently visited Nazira and her children. We found them well and thriving. Today, Nazira proudly supports her family on her own. My mom has a job, and we have food, and we are happy. Thank you. God answered my prayers through your help. With my sewing skills, I even got a new job. Now we have everything we need. You made all of this possible. Thank you. You know, we were talking about miracles a moment ago. This, for this family, was a miracle. These children were almost separated from their mom for the rest of their lives, and there was nothing she could do about it. Then you showed up, 700 Club members. We just want to say thank you. This mom has dignity. She's got her kids. They've got hope in the future. That little boy's not waiting at his window, hoping that his mom's going to come back. He's in his family. That's part of what Orphan's Promise does, keeping families together. Where poverty is an issue, children should not be put in orphanages. They need to be with their moms and dads whenever possible. Help us do that. Listen, helping children is just one of the things that happens when you join the 700 Club. You're digging water wells for people who don't have clean water. You're offering food to people who are hungry, surgery to people who are in desperate situations, life-saving surgery to many people, all kinds of work being done in the name of Jesus and because of your kindness and generosity. Join us today. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Listen, when you call our toll-free number 1-800-700-7000 and say you want to join, we're going to send you answered prayer. Boy, after today's show, if you don't want this DVD, I don't know what you want. This is going to talk to you about how to pray effectively and efficiently. And I found it a great blessing. After many years of being a believer, I think it'll bless you too. So call now. Okay.
Got Ready some, for some email? Got some questions. Okay. This is I'm a viewer who says, I found out my husband of many years has been watching porn. When I confronted him back in 2016, he said he wouldn't do it again, but he has. The feeling of not being worthy is horrible. I've tried to talk to him. We're trying counseling. He doesn't like to go, says it's one-sided. He says he feels like he's make, being made to do something he doesn't like to do. His moods change quickly. Happy one minute, angry the next. It's hard. We have a young child. I want to save our marriage. What do I do? Um, let me let me talk to you. Uh, that I assume that phrase, the feeling of not being worthy, is horrible. You're talking about yourself, and you're worthy. And, and don't for a minute think that his addiction to pornography has anything to do with you uh, about whether you're attractive enough or good enough or worthy enough. It's not about you. He's addicted. Uh, pornography is addictive. It literally rewires your brain. Uh, and uh, psychologists are now saying it's equivalent to cocaine, that it gives this uh, pleasure rush and pleasure centers of the brain. And when you get exposed to it, it's like uh, taking some kind of hit of crack cocaine. Realize that if he is powerless over his addiction, well, so are you. And only God can restore you. So look to Him for your worthiness, for your love, for your comfort. He will give it to you. Here's a word from 1 Corinthians. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him.